It gives me great pleasure to introduce Pete Early, a man who has done so much to advocate for more effective responses for people with mental illness, particularly those within the criminal justice system. Pete has written 17 books, but the one that caught my attention early on was Crazy, A Father's Search Through America's Mental Health Madness, and that was a Pulitzer Prize winning finalist, and I would encourage any of you that haven't read it to do so. It's compelling, and it's heartfelt, and it's educational, and it has provided a lot of guidance in my career. Pete Early, after a 14-year career in journalism, including six years at the Washington Post, became this full-time author with a commitment to expose the stories that both entertain and surprise. His life was turned upside down by events, which we'll hear of shortly, and with the writing of Crazy, he became known as one of the key spokespeople on this issue, joining the National Alliance on Mentally Ill and other families around the country in deploring the conditions that so many of our loved ones find themselves in when they seek mental health treatment. His advocacy has taken him across the U.S. and the globe, and he delivers speeches like this to rally all of us to think about ways in which we, and so many of you are involved day to day in this activity, but how we can be even better at being sensitive to the needs and responding to individuals with mental illnesses that come in contact with the criminal justice system. It's my honor to introduce to you, Pete Early. Thank you, Fred. Thank you. I'm thrilled to be here. Thank you so much for inviting me. It's always fun to be the last speaker after a busy, busy day. So thanks for hanging in there. I really am thrilled to be here because for the last 10 years, I've been going across the country advocating for exactly what you people are doing. So I'm here today as a journalist. I'm here today as an author, but I've really come as a father to put a human face on what you're doing. And my story begins with a frantic car ride and my college-age son, Kevin, asking me this question, Dad, how would you feel if someone you loved killed himself? I'd, Kevin had been diagnosed a year earlier in New York where he was attending college with bipolar disorder, and a doctor had put him on medication, but my son had stopped taking his pills. And when I picked him up in New York, he'd been wandering around that city for five days. He was convinced God had him on a special mission. And during that frantic car ride from Manhattan to Fairfax County, Virginia, outside Washington, where I lived, he would laugh one minute, and then he'd begin sobbing the next. And I pleaded with him to take his medication. And he screamed at me, leave me alone. Pills are poison. And we got to the emergency room, and I remember the nurse rolling her eyes while Kevin talked gibberish about how God had him on this special mission. And then we were taken in a room all by ourselves and left there four hours later. Kevin said, there's nothing wrong with me. I'm going to leave. I said, hang on, son. Hang on. And I literally went outside and I grabbed a doctor. I will never forget how he came into that room. He came in with his hands up as if he was surrendering. He said, I'm sorry, I can't help your son. I said, you haven't even examined him. And he explained that it didn't matter. At that time, Virginia law was very specific unless a person posed an immediate, imminent danger to himself or others then he couldn't be required to undergo treatment. He couldn't be required to take pills. And the fact we'd been sitting there for four hours and no one had hurt anyone was proof there was no danger. So he looked at me and he said, you seem like a nice concerned father. I'll tell you what, you bring your son back after he tries to kill you or kill someone else. Well, I took my son home, and during the next 48 hours, I watched him sink deeper and deeper into a mental abyss. At one point, he had tinfoil wrapped around his head to keep the CIA from reading his thoughts through the television. He slipped out of the house. He slipped out. He broke into a stranger's house. Luckily, no one was there. He broke in to take a bubble bath. It took five police officers and an attack dog to get him out. And when they did, they took him over to a community mental health center, and they called me, and I went rushing over. And a policeman was standing outside, and he says, whoa, 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 Mr. Early. Before you go in, let me give you a little father-to-father -father advice. Even though your son has told us he has bipolar disorder, even though he's told us he's off his medication, even though we picked him up in a house where he was taking a bubble bath, unless you go inside and you tell that psychiatrist that your son has threatened to kill you, he will not meet Virginia's imminent danger criteria and we'll take him to jail and you don't want that. And I looked at him and I said, well, my son hasn't threatened to kill me. 
and he shrugged and walked away. So I'm here today to tell you, and I do it with no great pride, because it damaged my relationship with my son. I went in and I lied. I said, my son's threatened to kill me, and that was getting good enough to get him bound over where the next day he voluntarily committed himself into a hospital. But our problems were far from over. 24 hours after my son voluntarily committed himself to a hospital, I got a call from his doctor. I'm sorry, Mr. Early. The insurance company says they're not going to pay. They don't believe he needs to be here. He's not a danger. They want him loose. Well, I called that insurance company, and I got absolutely nowhere until I happened to mention that I used to work at the Washington Post. And I happened to mention that I was friends with Mike Wallace of 60 Minutes who suffered from depression and they should expect a call. Now, can you imagine getting that call? Hello, this is Mike Wallace with 60 Minutes. Why is Pete Early's son being pushed out of that hospital? All of a sudden, my son was allowed for a record-breaking 14 days. In between the short ride from New York to Fairfax County, Virginia. I had lied to get my son into treatment. I had violated my ethics because journalists aren't supposed to bully people. And just when I thought it couldn't get any worse, it did. I got a call from the Fairfax County Police Department. My son was being charged with two felonies, breaking and entering and destruction of property. I was so frustrated. Virginia law had kept me from getting my son help when he wasn't thinking clearly, and now I wanted to punish him for a crime he committed when he wasn't thinking clearly. I said to my wife, Patty, I want to help our son, but I don't know how to do it. And she looked at me and she said, well, then why don't you do what you do best? Pete Early, a father, can't find out much. But Pete Early, a journalist, can. Why don't you investigate this and see what's going on in mental health today? So... For once, I actually listened to my wife. Now, that is my only joke, folks. Sorry. If you don't get that one, we're out of luck. But I did some preliminary digging. And I discovered what happened to my son is no aberration. Right now, where we're sitting here in beautiful Washington, D.C., there are 365,000 people with schizophrenia and bipolar disorder and major severe depression sitting in American jails and prisons. More than 2 million go through the criminal justice system every year. And you all know these statistics. While states are trying to reduce their prison population, the number of persons with mental illness is actually increasing as a subgroup in prison. In California last year, 16 to 20 percent. According to the National Alliance on Mental Illness, 40 percent of persons with serious mental illness will have serious encounters with law enforcement during their lives. 49 percent of all police shootings involve persons with mental illness. A report released this week shows that people with mental illness are 16 times more likely to be fatally shot by the police. People with mental illness stay in jails and prisons four to eight times longer than those charged with the same crime. They have a likely a higher likelihood of getting charges passed against them while incarcerated. They cost seven times as much to incarcerate. They have an average recidivism rate 15 percent higher than the ASH national average, 85 percent recidivism rate. And I'm sure, as every one of you can repeat after me, the highest public mental facility in the United States today is not a hospital. It's the Los Angeles County Jail. Well, those facts alarmed me, and I decided I wanted to write about them. But before I did, I talked to my son. I said, Kevin, I'm thinking about writing a book about you. And he looked at me, and he said, well, who'd want to read that? And I said, no, 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 I'm going to find a jail far away from Fairfax County because I don't want to risk irritating a judge or a prosecutor. And I'm going to go in that jail, and I'm going to find people with mental illness, and I'm going to follow them through the criminal justice system out onto the streets to see what happens to them. And then I'm going to come back, and I'm going to talk to the judges and the correctional officers and the policemen and the parents and the consumers and try to make sense of it. He said, Dad, if it helps someone else, tell my story. Well, I started in the L.A. jail, makes sense, largest public mental facility. I lasted two days in the Twin Towers before they kicked me out. They said I was violating HIPAA. The truth was they didn't like me seeing what I was seeing there. I tried Cook County Jail next. They said no. I tried Rikers Island next. They said no. I tried Baltimore next. They said no. I tried Washington, D.C., my hometown, and they literally said, hell no. And I ended up going to Miami because of a forward-thinking judge, Judge Justice Steve Leifman, who said, I want you to see what's happening in our jail. So he got me in the Miami-Dade County Jail. On any given day, there are 1,200 prisoners with psychiatric problems in that jail. And when I did my research, I went into 
C block on the ninth floor. And I want to try to take you there. C block was a suicide wing. It was a U-shaped cell block. And the officers walked up and down the center. And the cells, there were 19 of them, had plexiglass fronts. And when you looked in those cells, I saw men completely in cells with nothing else in them. And because of a design flaw, the air conditioning was stopped by the plexiglass. So those cells were bone chilling cold, but there were no blankets. Cells built for two people had five and six people naked in them. And when you listened, you could hear the normal jail sounds of people talking. and door But when you listened closer, you could hear the asylum sounds. People screaming at unseen tormentors. And then I heard a thud, thud, thud. Then faster, thud, thud, thud. Then louder, thud, thud, thud. It was one of the inmates running forward, smashing his forehead in the plexiglass, splitting it open. I ain't crazy, he screamed. Well, then quit acting like you are. An unconcerned officer called back. Now, I spent 10 months in this jail, and I got to know the officers really well, and they said, we call this the forgotten floor. And I thought they were talking about the inmates. No, they were talking about themselves. Not one of these officers received any kind of training to work with persons who had mental illnesses. And when I got to know them better, they all told me in confidence that they were troublesome employers, employees, the bosses wanted to get rid of them, so they assigned them to work with the crazies because it was the worst job in jail, and they hoped they'd quit and go someone else. My tour guide was Dr. Joseph Poitier, a fabulous psychiatrist with an impossible task. A lot of people think if you can get someone arrested and get them in jail, they're going to get help, he told me. But we don't help people here. We're jail. We're not a hospital. I went with Dr. Portier on his morning rounds. That morning, there were 92 inmates on the ninth floor, suicide wing. His rounds took us 19 minutes. If you do the math, you'll see we spent 12.7 seconds talking to each inmate. Now, during the next 10 months, I followed several of these people through the system. I want to tell you about Alison Collier, classic case, schizophrenia, used to be in a state hospital. Now she's back in the jail here. Why was she in jail? Well, she was homeless, living in South Beach, uh, in a cardboard container behind a restaurant. She got up one morning, she's walking down the sidewalk, and she sees an elderly woman waiting for a bus, and she screams, stop stealing my thoughts, and she races up and she shoves the older woman, not hard enough to knock her, but she shoves her and she goes running away, and well-meaning witnesses came up and said, get her arrested, get her off the streets, you get her arrested, and she'll get help. Well, help is not what Alice Ann Collier got. Florida takes crimes against the elderly very seriously. In fact, any crime against a person over the age of 65 can be charged as a felony. And because she had been charged twice before with shoving elderly people at bus stops, she was charged under that state's three strikes law, which meant she faced a maximum five, minimum five years in prison, non-negotiable. But when she was brought before the judge, the judge looked down and he said, wait a minute. I can't put this woman on. She's not competent. Send her to the state hospital in Chattahoochee to be made competent. Not treated, made competent, and there is a difference. Treatment means you actually get help. That's not what happened to her. Every day she was taken into a room, she was shown three chairs. On one chair was written the word judge, another one prosecutor, a third one defense attorney. And when Alice Ann Collier could tell her keepers who sat in each chair, she was deemed competent enough to be put on trial and she was sent back to the courthouse. Of course, she wasn't competent. She appeared before the judge and he looked at her and he went, wait a minute, I told you to go to Chattahoochee and get made, go back to Chattahoochee. When I found Alice Ann Collier in that jail, she'd been traveling between the jail and Chattahoochee 1,151 days, more than three years, and she'd never been put on trial. Now I'm a reporter, I got out my little pen and pad, and I go running over the prosecutor, look what I found, look what I found. And they told me with absolutely no embarrassment. They knew exactly what they were doing with Alice Ann Collier. In fact, they planned to keep her five years, which was the maximum they could without putting her on trial. Why? Because she was dangerous. Medication didn't seem to help her get stable. And there was no safe place, no safe place in the entire state of Florida. No hospital beds, no living facilities where she could be put. So they were keeping her on that bus intentionally riding her back and forth. Now she was typical. 
The kind of persons I was meeting in that jail were not Hannibal Lecter serial killers. They were people with schizophrenia and bipolar disorder and depression. Consider April Hernandez, same age as my son. Correctional officers came to me and they said, you should look into her case. She's been framed. And I said, really? Who framed her? Her own parents. Her own parents conspired with relatives to frame her to get her arrested for car theft. Why? Because she was psychotic. She was living homeless on the streets of South Beach where she'd been gang raped twice and beaten up three times by teenagers who thought it was hilarious to pick on people who were homeless and psychotic on Friday nights. And there was nothing her parents could do because she was not a danger to herself or others. Now her case was interesting because she had a co-occurring problem. She was addicted to drugs and everybody thought, oh, that's why she does this. And it was only after she was correctly diagnosed as having both a mental illness and a co-occurring co problem that they understood her underlying problems. And we know that 40% of persons who develop mental illnesses, such as bipolar and schizophrenia, have co-occurring problems. And I know that 75% of the people in jails and prisons have with mental illness have co-occurring problems. Now, the last person I want to talk to you about is Freddie Gilbert. I don't care if you live in Washington, if you live in Poughkeepsie, if you live in Fowler, Colorado, you know of Freddie Gilbert. A Miami study found that in a population of 2 million at any given time, there were 1,500 people who were in living in cars or on the streets and sleeping in parks. They were the homeless. But that same study found that those 1,500 most were able to move through our social network system into some kind of supportive housing except, except 507 individuals. They were the chronic homeless. They were always homeless. And those 507 in Miami, every one of them had a mental illness. And those 507 in Miami, every one of them had been arrested at least two or three times. And when I found Freddie Gilbert in that cell, he was naked, he stood there, he could not speak. He was so sick. And the officers controlled him by offering him sandwiches as if he were a dog performing for treats. And when I checked his record, I discovered that Freddie Gilbert had been in and out of that jail in the last year alone more than two dozen times, and he'd never gotten any help for his mental illness. And that's because he was charged with misdemeanors, and there were no programs available to him, even if he'd been wanted to go in one. So he's stuck in this revolving door, jail the streets. After my book was published, the University of South Florida's Mental Health Institute followed 97 frequent utilizers, which is the term they use now for people like Freddie Gilbert. They followed them over a five-year period. Listen to this. Nearly one, every one of them had schizophrenia. Everyone was homeless. Everyone had a co-occurring problem. Those 97 individuals were arrested 2,200 time, spent 27,000 days in jail, 13,000 days in crisis centers, state hospitals, and emergency room. They cost 13 million, and there was absolutely no reduction in recidivism and no recovery. How in the world have we gotten in this mess? Well, most of you know that we have come full circle. Back in colonial days, if you had a mental illness, you were taking care of your family, you were in jail, or the sheriff warned you out. He took you to the county line, told you to start walking and never come back to his county. In 1843, activist Dorothea Dix was going to teach a Bible class in Boston. And she walks, starts walking through the jail. And she goes through a cell block and she realizes that these people have no heat. They're literally freezing. And she rushes to the jailer and she says, you can't treat people like that. Those people are freezing. And he looks at her and he goes, oh, no, 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 Miss Dix, you don't understand. They don't feel the cold. They're lunatics. They don't feel cold like we do. Well, Dick spent the next two decades preaching that persons with mental illness needed treatment, not punishment. And she got 33 states to pass laws creating hospitals where people could be treated rather than punished. Well, we all know what happened next. During the next 50 years, most of these hospitals turned into giant asylums, warehouses where people were locked up and forgotten. In 19, and I, I got to tell you, in 1963 in Oklahoma, my native state, a journalist compared the hospitals there to Nazi concentration camps and said the hospitals were worse. 
1963, President John F. Kennedy heard the cries for reform. He called on Congress to pass a Community Mental Health Act and set aside $3 billion to create 2,000 community-based centers. The discovery of a promising new drug called Thorazine seemed to make it possible for people with serious mental illnesses to live outside these locked wards. Well, what happened? Kennedy was assassinated, the Vietnam War escalated, Congress got ensnarled in Watergate, Thorazine turned out not to be so wonderful, neighborhoods turned out not to want people, and a new acronym was created, Not in My Backyard, and persons with mental illness never a priority were shoved to a back burner. That three billion never got spent. Those 2,000 community centers never got open as planned. And during this time period, we still pushed forward with deinstitutionalization, the closing of these dreaded hospitals. And it was a fabulous idea that turned into a cruel joke. Why? Because states began turning people out left and right with no community safety net. Now, I thought deinstitution happened because of compassion and because of concern. I'd seen one flew over the cuckoo's nest. But I'm here to tell you, if you check your history books, you'll discover that the two main causes of deinstitution had nothing to do with compassion. They had to do with one, money, and two, money. State legislators were being driven in corners. People were filing exposés in newspapers. Lawsuits were being filed. You've got to fix these places up. They're going to cost millions and millions of dollars. And state legislators are going, oh my God, what are we going to do? We'll have to raise taxes. And then Uncle Sam came in and said, no, 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 no. I'll help you. We'll give you money. We'll take care of these folks. We'll give them housing. We'll give them Medicaid. But only if you get them out of those institutions. And overnight they said, yippee. And they shoved them out the door, eager to do it. Well, what happened next? The federal government didn't do any better job than the states did. In fact, in 1980, we elected Ronald Reagan. And we said, Reagan, you go to Washington. We're tired of Uncle Sam picking our pockets. You get this big bureaucracy off our back. And he did. He came to Washington. He began cutting the very programs that we said we would use to help people who needed out of these institutions. Well, it's been five decades since deinstitutionalization, three since the Reagan Revolution. So why are our jails and prisons still filling up with people whose primary crime is they're sick? Well, there's lots of reasons, but the main one is we still don't adequately fund community services. Let's go back to Miami. Not everybody in Miami who has a mental illness is sitting in a jail or prison. There are 4,500 people, when I did my research, in Miami who lived in 650 boarding homes, assisted living facilities. That's fantastic. We got them out of these horrible hospitals. Now they're right in our neighborhood, 650. Wow, that's great. Until you looked a little closer, you know those 650 boarding homes? 400 couldn't pass the minimum standard to operate as a boarding home. They were granted waivers by the state. What that means is if you tried to put anybody in that boarding home except someone who had a mental illness, it would have been against the law. And one of them I visited, there was a hole in the roof. Rain came through. Medications were scattered on the kitchen table. The person who ran the home only spoke Spanish. The people who were in the home only spoke English. There was no treatment, no therapy. There were meals of rice and beans and nothing but smoking cigarettes and watching TV. And I would argue, in these cases, we aren't helping these people. We're just hiding them better. Well, let's be fair. The average operator of one of those homes, when I did my research, got $29.90 per day to cover all the cost of that person, everything they needed, clothing, medicine, everything, $29.90 a day. Well, you know, I live in the Washington, D.C. area because when I travel, I put my pet in the executive pet center. And they charge me $36 a day to walk my pet, have a place for my pet to sleep. Give my pet. We pay, I pay $6 a day more to take care of my dog than what we were paying people in Miami to take care of persons with serious mental illness. Well, I don't want to pick on Florida in case some of you all are from Florida. Let's pick on my place, Fairfax County, Virginia. Okay, I know you guys think you got it made wherever you live, but Fairfax is, it's heaven. And I'm going to prove it to you. The average household income in America right now is 52000 a year. That's the average household income. In Fairfax County, the average household income is 150000 Three times what the average is. 150000 And that's because most people work for the federal government, so thank you very much for your tax dollars, okay? Yet, if you have a breakdown like my son right now in Fairfax County, Virginia, 
you'll have to wait seven days just to see a therapist. You'll have to wait six months to get a case manager. And you'll have to wait five to 18 years to get into subsidized housing. Is there any reason I call my book crazy? I'm not talking about people like my son. I'm talking about our fractured system. How are we responding to our crisis? Well, the mental health, health system is failing us. So we're turning on the criminal justice system to save us. Progressive communities such as yours are implementing programs to stop the inappropriate incarceration of persons with mental disorders. Let's go back to Miami. After my book was published, Judge Lightman launched a major transformation initiative. He began with the way communities always begin. He began with crisis intervention team training. You know, the year I did my book, there were five persons with mental illness shot to death by police. No CIT training. Now, Miami was skeptical. Every community is. They go, oh, we're going to have a hug-a-thug program. But once they got into it, it began to change the way they looked at persons with mental illness and how they dealt with them. In the last four years in Miami, CIT trained police officers have responded to 35,000 calls involving someone in a mental health crisis. The police departments realize that their officers rarely will draw a weapon, but every one of them will deal with someone with a mental illness. 24 calls per day or one per hour in Miami. Fairfax County, 500 calls a month, 16 per day. Under Lifeman's leadership, more than 4,000 law enforcement officers have been CIT trained in Miami. And the results have been incredible. Of those 35,000 calls, only 35,000 calls, 85 arrests. That's all. No police shootings. None in that time period. Implementing CIT is always the first step, but it's not enough. You have to go beyond that. Lifeman got his community to pass a $22 million bond issue to open up an assessment center rather than taking people to jail, rather than taking them to emergency room, taking them to a center where they could be assessed and then connected and linked to community services. And those charged with serious crimes who couldn't be immediately um, uh, diverted were then channeled into a mental health court. And those who weren't able to go through the mental health court went through the sequential intercept model so that when they got ready to leave, they were able to go right into services. They weren't just patted on the butt and sent out the door. Now, Bear County, home of San Antonio, has been doing that. It was one of the first. First year, 1,000 people with mental illness diverted from jail. Today, the program diverts 4,000 each year from jail, saving $5 million annually, $4 million in inappropriate emissions to emergency rooms. Union County, New Jersey, brags that 78% of those who complete its program have no arrest or convictions four years afterwards, a recidivism rate of 22%. Norfolk, Virginia, fewer repeat offenders, less jail time, saving 1.63 million 18 month period. Petersburg, four or 50 people in jail diversion, never re only four out of 50 reoffended. And that's why you're here today, and that's why I'm thrilled that these programs work they're not easy to get started, but they work. But there's something you need to remember now that you've taken on this responsibility. Something we've forgotten since deinstitutionalization. You can have the best CIT, you can have the best diversion, you can have the best mental health court, you can have the best sequential intercept model, you can have the best reentry program, and they're all going to be undercut if you don't have decent community services. Let's use a little common sense here. If I broke my arm, I wouldn't call up the police department and ask them to fix it. Now, if I needed heart surgery, I wouldn't call up the sheriff and ask them to fix it. And if I had really nasty hemorrhoids, I wouldn't call up your local judge and say, hey judge, you want to come over and take a look? So why are we asking the police, the sheriff, and judges to solve what should be a community problem? The best way to stop the criminalization of persons with mental illness is to provide them with good, engaged, meaningful community care before they get in trouble. We need to wake up and understand you can't talk 
about fixing our mental health system unless you want to talk about supportive housing. How can you get better if you're sleeping at a bridge? You can't talk about fixing our mental health system unless you want to talk about jobs, giving a person a purpose in life and a way to earn their living. You can't talk about it unless you talk about transportation. How can you expect someone to go see a therapist if they can't get on a bus and ride there? You can't talk about it unless you want to talk about drug and alcohol programs and helping them get over that. You can't talk about it unless you want to talk about veterans. And you can't talk about it unless you want to talk about giving people hope. Writer Hal Lindsey said it best, man can live about 40 days without food, three days without water, eight minutes without air, but only one second without hope. If we want people to fully recover, we must look beyond the criminal justice system. We must break down the silos and form more meaningful partnerships with every agency in our communities that touch the lives of someone who is sick. People say to me, oh, what's the answer to these poor people with schizophrenia? It's, it's just so sad. They can't get any better. And I always respond with one word, bull. And I cut that short out of respect for you, okay? People get better. The last 10 years, I've seen miracles. I've been to 48 states. I could tell you about Rick in Cincinnati, homeless for years, almost going to freeze to death. A really great psychiatrist went out, got him, got him into housing first, got him an ACT team, started community treatment. Now he's doing fantastic. I don't need to talk about Rick today. I'm going to talk to you about my son. He got probation. Two years. Every day he took his meds. He did great. He got a job. He even became employee of the month. As soon as that two-year period ended, he stopped taking his pills. I could see he was slipping. So we have a Fairfax crisis response team. I called him up and I said, please, please come over. I need someone to talk to him. He's off his meds. He's starting, whoa, 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 whoa. We don't have, we don't have time to, is he dangerous? No, he's not dangerous, not yet. But listen what happened last, no, 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 that's unfair. You can't condemn him on what happened last. You call him, call us if he gets dangerous. Well, the night my son became violent, the night I didn't have to lie. I called that same dispatcher. I said, please, please come. My son is violent. And he said, oh, wait a minute. Is he dangerous or is he violent? I said, he's violent. He said, oh, we don't come if they're violent. You call the police. So the police came and they shot my son twice with a taser and hogtied him and took him away. Now, I'm telling you that story for a reason. If I couldn't get my son engaged in the mental health system after writing a book with my Mike Wallace connections, living in fancy dancy wealthy Fairfax County, what chance does someone who has no connections, has no money, has no solid information about the system, what chance do they have in getting help they need? Eventually, Kevin recovered. He found a job, he was doing fine, 16, 16 months later, he stopped taking his meds, and this time it was Thanksgiving, and he could tell I knew he was off his meds, and he was terrified I was going to call the police, so he jumps in his car and he takes off, and I call him, and he won't answer, he won't answer, and finally he answers, I said, where are you going? He says, I'm going to heaven. Not exactly what a father wants to hear from a psychotic son. He hangs up. And four hours later, he finally calls me and he says, Dad, I'm in North Carolina. Well, if you're in North Carolina, congratulations. You're heaven, okay? <laughs> Sometimes you get to laugh, all right? So I said, okay, I'm out of gas. I said, okay, don't call the police. Okay, I won't call the police. I'll come get you. No, don't come. Well, go get some gas. I'll give you a credit card number. No, you don't understand, Dad. You don't understand. If I step out of this car, the voices are telling me I'm going to die. I said, at this point, I realized there's no use trying to argue with someone who is psychotic. It just doesn't work. And I said, okay, okay, calm down. Now, you all, and I know, if he stepped out of the car, he wasn't going to die. But how do you know that? How do you know you're listening to me? How do you know you're sitting in Washington, D.C.? Your mind is telling you that. And I'm telling you right now, if your mind told us, if you walked out that door, we were all going to die, we'd all get to be really good friends. So I said all right, I'll help you. And I did what no father should do. I arranged for my son to drive psychotic, got him gas. He drove psychotic up 95. I 
We stayed on the phone till the batteries went out. He went off the road twice. Luckily, he didn't hit anyone. Luckily, he wasn't stopped. Came to my house. I said, okay, what do you want to do? I want to be your partner. I don't want to be the parent. Just tell me what. There's a safe house, Dad. A friend of mine went to it. I want to go there. I need to get my thoughts together. I don't want to take pills. Fine. Took him to the safe house. In the middle of the night, he got up. He took off all his clothes because all of us know if you take off your clothes, you're invisible. And he walked outside. But listen to what happened to him this time. A CIT trained officer picked him up in Fairfax, and my son said, don't handcuff me, I'm not a criminal, that's why I got tasered. I ran when they handcuffed me, and he used his discretion, he said, fine, just get in the back of the police car. He treated him with respect, and he took him to the emergency room. And when that doctor said, well, it's not dangerous for somebody to walk around naked, the guy said, oh, really, Dr. Smith, I'm going to look up your address, and I'm going to drop him off on your front lawn. I don't recommend that. But all of a sudden, my son was admitted, and he got a case manager, and she said to him, why don't you take your medication? He said, I've gained 60 pounds. I can't drink. I can't think clearly. I can't have sex. I didn't even know he was having sex, but anyway. <laughs> That's important to a young man, I hear. <laughs> she said, okay, let me find you a doctor who can work with you on your meds. You know, my son's seven psychiatrists, only two have bothered to learn anything about him but his name and symptoms. And that's because they're told by the insurance company, you're only going to get paid for 15 minutes, figure out what the pill to give to him, and let someone who's cheaper do the rest of the work. But treating the mind also requires treating the heart. And then the case manager said to him, you know, you're too old to live with your father. And I didn't know how to take that either, but that was fine with me. I'm going to put you in an apartment with two guys with schizophrenia. So you will have to pay rent. You'll have to be responsible, have some pride in yourself. And so he moved in and he became independent. And then she said, what are you gonna do with your life? Oh, what can I do? I have a mental illness. She said, knock it off, control the illness. Don't let it control you. I wanna help people. All right, I got the perfect job for you. It's called peer to peer. It's a person with lived experience helping someone, just like an AA, someone who's alcoholic helps someone else. He said, I'd like to try it. So she got him the training. Let me brag about my son. Fellow over 300 pounds, schizophrenia, hadn't been out of his parents' basement for months and months and months. My son started going over, visiting and talking to him. He finally got him out. They went to McDonald's, not the best choice. Went to McDonald's, but he got him out. Now that doesn't sound like much. It doesn't sound like much unless that's your son. And if that's your son, it's a lot. Today, my son works for Fairfax County. He lives in his own apartment. He pays his own rent. He pays taxes. And he hasn't had a psychiatric break in eight years. So don't tell me. <laughs> It's all doing, his doing. Don't tell me recovery is impossible. I've seen it. What do people with mental illnesses want? Why do we ask such a stupid question? They want the same thing all the rest of us want. They want a safe place to live, a purpose in life, and people to love them. Which brings me to you. What can you do? By being here today, you have proven that you are not widget makers. You have chosen careers that demand a higher public calling. Margaret Mead said it best when she said, never doubt that a small group of thoughtful, committed citizens can change the world. Indeed, it's the only thing that ever has. I believe that every moment creates an opportunity for us to fix our broken system. Let me repeat that. Every moment creates an opportunity for us to fix our broken system. Be part of that moment. Seize that moment to fix our system. I was raised in Oklahoma. I've lived in Washington long enough. I have to give you a warning. I'm about to tell a religious story. I'm not proposing religion. I'm not anti-religion. Hey, I just like the story, okay? And I like the imagery that it projects, and I hope you will too. Uh, when I was little growing up, my dad was a preacher, and I'd sit there and in Oklahoma, that means you went to church every Wednesday and every Saturday and twice on Sunday. And I'd sit there going like, not hearing a word he said. But there was always one story that got my attention. And that's because it's about a woman who's having sex. They're in the Bible. You just got to know where to look for them, okay? <laughs> this woman is caught in adultery. Notice it's always in the Bible. It's always the women who get caught in adultery. 
And they drag her in the center of town. Everybody's getting gathered around, picking up stones. This is going to be fun. We're going we're to really get rid of this one. And we read that the teacher picks up a stone and he says, let ye who's never sinned cast the first stone. And we read the people drop the stones, they put them down, and they walk away because they realize all of us have sinned, all of us have made mistakes, none of us are pure. I have a good friend named Brian Stevenson, just wrote a book called Just Mercy, fabulous attorney in Alabama, death row cases. And Brian likes to talk about what he calls stone catchers. People who step between the angry mobs who want to throw those stones and protect those who can't protect themselves. And he talks about the stone catchers because I'm afraid that today there are people who don't want to put down those stones. They want to throw them. They want to get rid of people who are different. People have mental illness. People have drug and alcohol problems. Lock them up. Throw them away. Just get rid of them. It's the stone catchers who give us hope. And I see you people as stone catchers who stand between that angry horde and you protect these folks until they can join you and protect others. And it's the stone catchers. Stone catchers who give me hope. My son has a mental illness and I'll be forever grateful to people such as you who can look beyond the madness in his eyes and see a person of worth who has parents and brothers and sisters who love him. So thank you for being part of this movement. Thank you for being here today. Thank you for being a stone catcher. Seize the moment. I'll guarantee you will change and save someone's life. Thank you very much. Thank you. You're very kind. Thank you. Whew. Not a... Uh simple matter to reflect on what we've heard and to reflect on the last couple of days and uh, I can't thank Pete enough for putting the human voice and human perspective in sometimes what can be dry system level policy discussions but it really is at the end of the day all about the people that we serve and responding effectively to their needs. There's an epilogue in part to the book Crazy and the work that Pete described in Miami-Dade, and Pete and I had a chance to sit in the Supreme Court uh, about three weeks ago and watch uh, Judge Leifman receive the William Rehnquist Award for achievement uh, for his work in Miami. And not only is Judge Leifman deserving of it, but I think for those of us in the room to uh, hear Chief Justice Roberts talk about the criminalization of people with mental illness and the need for more effective responses suggested that the dialogue and conversation that we've been having for years has reached people in important places and in a way that may make the path forward a little bit more easier. But it can't be any easier without voices like Pete Early painting a picture, horrid at the beginning, but hopeful at the end, that should remind us that our mission is one we can't put down. Um, I was asked to do some closing remarks and uh, reflect on what we've done the last couple of days. I think that it's been a very powerful set of conversations. Uh, we've heard from federal agency directors and state policymakers and local experts. Uh, we've had many of you uh, both donate your time to help us with development of presentations and be here and share your knowledge and wisdom. We have heard from our grantees who really are where the rubber meets the road and the real world experts that understand on a very personal day-to-day -day basis the challenges and the opportunities that are there. It's been so gratifying to see the networking that's gone on because you live in very different communities and jurisdictions but you share the same goals and missions in improving our public health and public safety. 
the can you send me that MOU do you describe that you know allowed information sharing between the public defender and the state's attorney and the judge and how about your card that I've been seeing exchanged and that really is what these convenings are about sharing your own sense of what works and learning from others about how to apply that with in your own settings and to take it home you've asked all the right questions you know how are we going to sustain what we're doing we've got a small grant now how do we build it how do we sustain it what's the type of information we need to convince our policymakers and leaders at home that what we're doing is worthwhile and we want to join you in that effort I used a metaphor on the first day about being pebbles in the pond and we've been talking big about systems change and reform but one can only do what one can do and yet if we don't let that ripple out and we don't see that the good work we do has a chance of influencing so many others we can feel a little isolated in it but I can assure you that the ripples are being felt and appreciate you for starting them I think that uh, we purposely bookend the last couple of days with the people that matter most we heard from Terence uh, Vincent uh, Terrari the first day a consumer shared his experiences we've heard from a family member this evening sharing their experiences and it keeps it real for all of us so that we keep focus on what really matters which is the lives of people that we try to impact in positive ways tomorrow we're going to be joined by Second Chance Act grantees a thousand new people for you to interact with and exchange cards with I hope you can stay for one or two or all of the days that remain while their grants are focused on reentry they deal with the same target population that you work with people with behavioral disorders and they need to learn from you and you from them and I hope that opportunity is available for you I'd be remiss if I didn't thank a few people at this point in time first of all the Bureau of Justice Assistance for making this all possible their leadership their guidance their oversight their funding I also want to thank our behavioral health team at the Justice Center who have worked long and hard to put this together and hopefully in a way that's been helpful to all of you our communications team who's responsible for the 10 foot visages on the side and the uh, PowerPoints that you've seen and also working hard over this period of time our conference administrators behind the scene the people behind the desks that you don't often get a chance to see out front but really what make this all possible and couldn't happen without them and then most importantly our participants and that's all of you for doing what you do on a day-to-day -day basis for taking a break join us here in Washington and for hopefully going home inspired and motivated to continue the good work that you've started